Hi, I'm Laura Park Lincoln. Welcome to Slash and Cast Podcast. Join us for exciting new adventures. First of all, uh, I want to start with you, Laura. The fact that you're diving back into this role of Tina Shepard after 30 years. I mean, what is it like reprising a character after all these years? I have waited for this moment. So <laughs> I am over the moon excited because I always felt that Tina needed, um, needed another story. And I, and I think the fans did too. Everyone wanted to see the the telekinesis and the battle play out a little more. So it just seemed to get further and further away. And um, I've gotten, received a lot of scripts that just weren't a direction I wanted to take her. So when this came to being and Peter and I started talking, it just made perfect sense to bring her back and continue the story. So, yeah, let's say, yeah, why now? I mean, why after 30 years? What was it about those other scripts that just weren't working for you? Um, I found mostly that they they were, um, that most people were just trying to do Friday the 13th to be in the franchise in some way, but they weren't following that story of Tina and something, you know, John Carl Beekler, our director, and I had talked about many times was that we may have to take uh, the, the Tina continuation into a sideline story because of all the ownership rights of the different Fridays, the Friday the 13th. And it just became this big, massive, overwhelming task. And I, I really like what Peter's done. Um, I had always wanted to bring Tina back in a very specific way that fit in with the original story. And I think we've done that. I think we're going to shoot that. Yeah. So for you, Peter, I mean, you are in a situation as like a first time director and taking the reins of a film like this. And then you reach out to one of the favorite final girls, uh, favorite Friday 30 alumni. Uh, what kind of pressure comes with that now having Laura Park Lincoln jump into the role of Tina once again? Well, I can't tell you all the pressure because then I don't want to scare her off. <laughs> <laughs> but um, as I told Laura, I sent you that video, Laura. Um, Friday, the, you know this, me and Riley love part seven because um, I was about 12 years old when seven came out. Um, and that was my, my favorite movie by far back then. And the way Jason looked and you, and sorry, you were very pretty. And I was a young boy and I had a crush. <laughs> and and the, way, job. <laughs> <laughs> the way Kane looked and, and the weapons and just, oh, it was, it was just so different than any other Jason to me. Um, and out of all my, I have shadow boxes for almost every single Friday 13th. And I show every single one is just a Jason. There's nobody else but Jason's in them, except yours has me and you from Chicago in it. Oh my gosh, that's so awesome. Yeah, and, the, and that Chicago was so cool, the mad monster. If you remember, it was supposed to be Kane in costume. And then we were like in line and I, I don't know if it was you or your manager said, Hey, why don't Lar jump in those? Put right, I was over there and somebody said, Lar, do you want to do photo ops? And I'm like, well, of course, you know, I'll go over there, but it wasn't on the schedule. No. So it no. worked out perfectly. So then you jumped in, you probably only jumped in on like 12 or 15 of us doing it. And then only a few of us ever came back to you and had it signed. Yeah. So I'm feeling pretty lucky with that picture up there. <laughs> yeah, that was a pretty fun photo shoot too. We even had yeah. a guy propose to someone, not me, right. but uh, somebody did propose to someone during that photo op also. Yeah. Yeah. So, so back to the pressure, uh, it's always been a, a dream of mine. And then when I, uh, me and uh, Riley Lar one day, I just woke up and I was like, Hey man, what do you think about doing a, a part seven? What if I did a part seven? Almost like crazily. Yeah. And uh, he's like, I, I don't know. And then I wrote a whole bunch of stuff and came up with it. And I'm like, why don't you direct it? And he's like, why don't you direct it? And then that's it. It just, <laughs> it just took off from there. So uh, I, I reached out to Lar on, on Facebook Messenger, which is probably the least professional way. Well, it's a miracle I ever even saw it because yeah. I think there's messages on there from 10 years ago or when it started. <laughs> So that I don't really even know exactly how I saw that message. Yeah. So, so it was like two or three weeks or something. And I'm like, ah, oh, it's not going to happen. And then I remember I was in the grocery store and it's like, Hey Pete, this is large. Just got your thing. And I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then from there, um, if we'll tell the funny story, I wrote, I had a vision of what the script was or what was going to happen with her. And I'll, she doesn't have to answer, but I'll tell the truth. I said, this is what I think you're going to do. And she was like, 
oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> and then we, we, we hung up the phone. I, I told you, I told everybody, I'm like, oh, we're losing her, man. I don't know. I got to go back and write something different. So <laughs> I went back. She's like, why don't you send me a script? So I went back and wrote the whole script part, wrap around front and back, yep. sent it to her. And then thank God she said she loved it. I, I did. I really did. And it, it was funny because all, all of my, my students and my kids, whatever, they, they're like, mm, Laura, your face is pretty clear uh, in your voice when you're like, mm, not so sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that night I was, you know, trying to be very polite and listen to the story and the idea. And then I asked you a few questions and you're like, um, can I get back to you on that? Right. Your reason why I, I knew from the first time you answered that, it, it, we didn't have it so I, and you know you were probably right because i never really thought you were going to answer and say yes so I, I i wasn't even prepared so, so then then i just i didn't sleep and i was like i gotta get this thing right you know yeah yeah exactly it goes to show you gotta go after those dreams because they can happen yeah. you can make yeah. stuff happen yeah. like it's all odds and we have an app called marco polo it's like a facetime app so yeah. um, I would send them to Riley and Jason Brooks. And if, if you know me, I'm very animated. So I would get the, I'm like, hey, man, and then we're going to do this. And then she gets, ah, what do you think about it? <laughs> and they would give me feedback. So they helped in the process. That is so much fun. I love everybody involved with the project. You remember I went back and uh, um, guys, I mean, I actually called people uh, that, that y'all had worked with and, and watched um, Vengeance, right? Yep. And looked, looked back at some of the other projects and talked to people and uh, kind of really did some detective work, uh, <laughs> you yeah. know, to, to make sure this was all. And you, were, you sent me the picture of us at the con and, yep. you know, just trying to, to be sure of who I'm dealing with. And I was using every I, sales technique that I knew in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I really liked, I started, you know, I, I got the information on the other actors from you and dug into that a little bit. And I was really happy with those choices. They looked, they looked great. Everything looked like it was really pulled together well. So it is truly a dream to get to, to wrap her story a little bit and, and you know we'll have we'll get to see what happens after that you know ambulance uh took her and, and nick away after the end of all of that trauma and we'll get to kind of see what happens as time progresses a little bit so yeah. and i think rebecca is is a great look for you for she's for fabulous she's more beautiful than i could ever be and no. i think that's <laughs> perfect i will take 10 of her to walk around acting like me any day <laughs> I'm glad you approve because it's, it's not easy to, to find that look and I think she nails it pretty good yeah I think so I think it'll yeah. be very cool yeah she she's unbelievably talented so I'm really excited to see her take on that character as well that's what I've heard so I'm excited about that too I really am it was like okay be because what I was saying with you is um, when I watched her, a couple of her performances, she has really good micro aggressions and micro acting in her face. And that's what you did in seven. There's a lot of scenes where you're not really talking, but it's right. close on your eyes and the way you're acting, you, you're talking through your face. And I think she nails that. Yeah, I, I, I saw that also when I was looking at, at some of her things. And that was something about Tina. She was so, um, she was being attacked on so many sides, you know, from right. people she trusted and people she didn't know and people she didn't know and then the you know the monster coming from uh, nowhere basically and, and tormenting her whole life she was facing so many emotional challenges she wasn't just scared through the movie she was tormented and yeah. uh, antagonized and um, crazy making they call it you know if you do something enough you make someone actually think they're going crazy and and Tina was dealing with all of that and right. she's a very vulnerable person you know when we were shooting the first one uh, for for a minute they were discussing making tina dark 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 hair i mean my hair was dyed brown and um really really dark and more of a goth feeling yeah thank goodness that john beekler you know was really like saying no no that that's not tina she's the girl that that has really been um pretty much tortured and and tossed away most of her life trying to figure out this crazy story that did she imagine it or not so I was right. glad he kept her with that, that softer feel. I think it, I think it looks, cause you look innocent when you're just sitting there. Yeah. So I agree. So then you show the pain through your acting instead of just trying to show the goth look right away. Right. That's what, that's what I thought too. So, you know, and then, you know, goth wasn't even that strong of a look. So that was an interesting idea to go with, but I'm glad that they ended up staying on that softer side. 
as too. Tina's strength comes as she starts to realize everything is truer and truer and truer and you know, she's going to fight until it's over. And, right. and that comes from ha needing that, that feeling of um, wanting, she wanted to tell her story, but nobody was really listening. Right. Yeah. Right. It's funny you say that too, because the peer pressure, you're right. There's mm -hmm. pressure from Dr. Cruz. And then there's pressure from your history. And then, um, oh my God, what's her name? The girl with the, the necklace. Uh, well, she played Melissa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, her starting with you. So you got it from all ends. You're right. I never really thought about it that before. Yeah, and even her mother too, you know? Yeah, and, my, and yeah. The, the mother, you know, Sue Blue, who's awesome. She was obviously, she was the mother that was trying, you know, so hard to figure out what was going on, putting her trust in a system of doctors and, and putting her daughter away and bringing her back. And of course the mother had lost her husband in a fight, you know, they'd had a fight and then her husband dies and the brunt blame of it goes to her daughter. So, you know, there were all of these little emotional things that were happening at the same time. And then you add in Jason, you know, right. so. <laughs> <laughs> when, when me and Peter were going back and forth as he was prepping the, the script for you, we talked a lot about legacy and how important the character of Tina is to do her right. So how important is the legacy of Tina for you? I have to say, when, when I got the role, you know, you talk about some pressure. Um, when I got the role, I was very aware that this show had already been going for a long time and you hadn't had a character like Tina come in. And I, I didn't want a whole bunch of comparisons to the Carrie character. We had, we had some of that, which was fine because I, I loved that show too. But I wanted her kind of stand alone and I knew, I knew it was going to depend on the fans whether or not they embraced that unique story and take it in a different direction. So I always, um, I didn't do part eight, literally, because they wouldn't give me a script. That's, that's literally what it was. And as a young actor, passing on that was really hard, um, really hard. Uh, you know, it was more money than I'd ever seen in my life to do it. And passing on that was crazy. But I just had this feeling, since, they, since I didn't have a script, they were known for killing off final girls in the beginning of the next movie. And I didn't want that to happen to her. So when Peter, Peter and I were talking about this, I said, look, I got to have a condition, you know, um, <laughs> on Tina's um, uh, survival. So that was important to me. Now, uh, to tell you the truth, the original script uh, had young, uh, well, had a different ending. Uh -huh. So, but now that you're on board, the ending is completely different. And I like it. I, I like it way better. Yeah, I like it. I think the fans will like it. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. <laughs> It, Roseblood in and of itself is about as ambitious as you can get in terms of trying to follow up with a Friday the 13th movie, make a sequel directly to one of these movies. I think part seven is about as difficult as it gets other than doing like Jason takes Manhattan part two. So when you look at, when you look at that, especially like you, Peter, like uh, why go that direction? You know, a lot of these fan films, uh, not just so much fan films, but you could easily just go and make a cheap, cheap film, out in the woods somewhere but instead you decide you want to do this big facility you want to bring in a friday the 13th alumni and take all these pretty crazy practical effects to the point that um i'm i'm worried for you <laughs> um so so why why go this route why go this very difficult route go big or go home right so uh <laughs> um vengeance, vengeance did part six part vengeance did basically part six part two you right. know and then we, i was you know, a big part of getting with CJ and Steve and all them on board. So um, after that, and then Fall Camp Blood, which you're doing is, is a part four, part two. And my favorite film is part seven. My favorite final girl is Tina. I'm friends with Kane. He's like my hero. We, we talked the other day. So like, what, why would I ever do anything else outside of that? But you're right. It is tough because that outfit alone, you know how expensive it is. The one we're getting for the part seven, the mask is expensive. Um, the facility we're building, uh, everything is, is on a higher level, but I'm not going to go from vengeance and go down. I want to at least try to go up. And especially with Tina on board, now the pressure is through the roof. I'm going to start smoking crack pretty soon. But uh, <laughs> That's a different film. Yeah, a very different film. Um, but no, no, it's a good thing because um, you know I'm pretty organized. And now with her on board too, everybody else is like realizes I got to step every up. A couple of the people that are on there are now having uh, acting coaching, even guys who are just extras in the back with one line or two line. So everybody's taking it more serious. Um, the graphic team is great. The marketing is great. Um, 
I don't know. I just wanted to go big and go home. It's it's a dream come true. I mean, obviously, if we could get Kane, that'd be even better. But I don't know. Have you talked to him since Lars got on board? We could I, just... I, <laughs> bro, I made an entire video. And I just sent it to him. Yeah. I tried jokes. I tried everything. I would have got naked. <laughs> I, do. I don't care. <laughs> but at the, at the very least, you know, he's, he's super supportive. Oh, and yeah. and he, so he's, all, he's, he's gung-ho for it. He, he's rooting for you 100%. Yeah. Um, yeah, so when it comes to, to Rose Blood and trying to take this into a short film and re-explain the story, when you were addressing the Tina story, did you already have something very specific in mind, Peter, or did you just kind of watch it slowly evolve? Um, slowly evolve. So, so originally it was just going to be a flashback with her being interrogated in the room because um, I honestly thought even if we could get her, how long could we get her and how much would she do? So it was just a flashback. And then, like we said, with the story, once she was on board or, or partially on board, I wanted to do a lot more. And that's funny you say the word legacy because me and her talked about that. I wanted to cement the legacy and I wanted Tina to stay in Tina character. And what would she be like all those years later? How, how could you show her strong but still hurt and then wrap it up the, that same way? So once she, I, I saw excitement from her, that got me pumped up to, to write it the way I should have wrote it the first time. What about for you, Laura? If you always had like this, this image in mind for where Tina would be all these years later. Absolutely. I knew exactly where she'd be. And that's what we've got. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I had, I had actually written a part eight myself and pitched it to Paramount at the time. And uh, it had a lot of the same feeling in it. And uh, John and I had discussed it many times uh, where we thought she would have gone from that ambulance ride after um, getting well from that night of terror. And uh, that's exactly what we're doing with it. So yeah, I feel really, really solid about it. So for, is there anything you could give us, Peter, in terms of rose blood? Uh, I could give, I could give the whole story, but you, you're the one in charge here. Uh, is there anything, anything teasers you could give to fans that are listening? Yeah, first of all, I want to see your earring a little better, Laura. What's that earring you got right there? It's like, oh, it's just yeah. a cute little. Look at that! It's like a part seven. Yeah, it is. I have a whole yeah. bunch of part seven things. Aren't they fun? It I mean, is. It's the best I... mask of all. It was the best. Yeah. I saw you talking. I'm like, is that a mask hanging off her ear? <laughs> well, we do have Friday the 13th this month, so. Yeah, tomorrow. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which today, when people are listening to this. Yeah. Today. <laughs> um, so let's see, giveaway. Um, well, Jason Brooks being the Jason from Vengeance, that's a big plus. Um, Marcio Charlie, who makes the outfit, who Riley could tell you, Lars, is the best suit maker in the world right now. Got to be one of the best. Yeah. Um, so the fact that we got that on board, the same weapons from seven, uh, you on board, our own facility, 60 feet by 30 feet, uh, removable walls, two different, two or three different cameramen with three or four different cameras. That is all good. As far as the story is, everybody knows it's 13 months. I like that better than one year. 13 months after the events of part seven, where we find Tina in the Camp Crystal Lake research facility. Now, if anybody's familiar with part 10, Camp Crystal Lake Research Facility was actually built by the military right next to the lake. So it makes a lot of sense how Jason's right there. Um, there's some more characters that I don't know if I want to reveal from different ones that are in there, but basically the, the government is a, running this facility is trying to use Tina as a weapon, basically, which would make sense. Um, and I love the whole aspect of the story is because in Tina, in, in part seven, just imagine when she goes to the cops or the military to tell the story how did everyone that no one's going to believe her what happened Says you know, what she, went on yesterday yeah exactly <laughs> they're going to think she's crazy Why and they're going to a child you know when i killed my father in the lake yeah exactly so they're going to think she's crazy and put her in an asylum but when the rumors get high up the government says well if this is true we could use her so and they probably got dr cruz's notes and they want to use her for a weapon and that's how the story takes place and then rose comes in rose is basically like another tina a younger version of Tina that the military thinks they could use too. They interact, they build a bond and the story unfolds from there. So, you know, I, I want to reiterate what you're saying about the, those who are involved um, because you mentioned JC, you mentioned Marcio and, and the kind of equipment you're using, but everybody involved is so gung-ho. It's, it's, 
it's something that I haven't gotten to experience across all these fan films. You know, it's usually, you know, people kind of step in. I ever have somebody like ask you like, Oh, what kind of film are you raising money for? And they don't understand horror. And you're like, Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a slasher movie. It's a Friday. <laughs> uh, the thing is like with this, it's not like that. Every single person involved is excited and wants to do the absolute best they can. And I think Roseblood is going to turn out very special for, for that reason alone, not to mention everything else. I'll give you one more reason. Lar. I mean, the fact that she's letting me do these Lar themed perks and helping out with signatures and she promotes the crap out of it. <laughs> she's putting it on. She's putting it on her page, on her Indiegogo, uh, I, I mean, on her, her Instagram, everywhere. So, I mean, man, what a home run to have one of your idols and, and your favorite Final Girls ever be on your film. And then you, you wake up, you're like, what? She posted it? It's, yeah. it, it's really helping us. So th- I want to say thank you so much for that, because not every star does things like that. So thank well, you. You're welcome, because I'm thrilled. And I've always said, you know, being an actor, like when you go to fan conventions and get to meet people and people that have oh gosh, they've taken so much time and money. A lot of times they take time off work to come meet you and visit with you about stuff you've done. What better job? You know, I get to wake up and people are having fun watching, you know, some character I created. So I have always felt that as an actor, you take a role and do your best with it. And then just know going forward, usually it's out of your hands, but to always just be be proud of what the role was that you did and the project that you did as much as possible because we don't control a lot of it. So um, I have always loved horror movies and scary movies. So it was just a blast. And how much fun this many years later to still get to play with this character. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It, sure. It, it's also pretty crazy how much money has been raised wow. despite the lack of coverage uh you know a lot of these fan films that have raised big money they're getting covered by bloody disgusting they're getting covered by horror domain and things like that uh, it's just been you uh some youtubers like uh, myself and you know we watched a movie and then just fans that, that's all it's really been uh so it's unbelievable what has already been accomplished despite really not a lot of moral support coming from horror sites so far so far, so far. i imagine so they'll far. jump all over it soon I, I, this, well, that's the goal. So after this interview, um, I've got emails lined up and, and this interview lined up and everything. So that's the goal, 100%, to for people to cover it. I mean, why wouldn't they? I don't. It's it's huge news. Yeah. Fun stuff. Yeah. You, oh, so, some sometimes horror sites are just weird. I don't get it. They they, <laughs> they miss some big pictures sometimes. <laughs> I had a I, I had a question for Tina. If I may jump into the question role, please. Uh, when did you know that? Tina was such a success with Friday 13 fans because back when you first released it, cons weren't like they were now. So I, I wondered when you realized that. I didn't even know there was one. I mean, Kane and I went to a couple of comic book signings and maybe one thing, but I, I didn't even know that that was a thing even when I was there. So um, the night that it premiered in LA, um, <laughs> just did this. I, I thought, well, I'll just go to the main movie and just walk in and, and watch it with everybody else. So, um, I just took some friends and I had on my glasses and I went and watched the actual show, not thinking that anyone could recognize someone that's on a screen sitting next to them. Right. So that was, um, I just didn't think anything about it. And then I got chased out of that theater by, by a mob of fans. And wow. uh, it was so scary. And I actually, I actually hid next to a van in a parking lot and watched them all run by um, because they were excited about Tina. So I, I still didn't really realize it was, um, you know, you don't know if it's going to be a hit until you start hearing from fans as time goes by, right? right. You know, because you go on to shoot something else or whatever. And, and then yeah. you slowly start hearing how much people liked it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even now it's still a, a big hit at cons. And I, I, I met you a few years back at a convention. Actually, this sign, this Crystal Lake sign is, is signed by you. Um, there you go. <laughs> yeah so f- fans even all these years later even like for me you know because i i wasn't i was born in 96 uh so i didn't get to experience like the hype of these movies yet right. even my generation and now with the video game generations younger than me are still absolutely loving the franchise mm-hmm. did you yeah. find did you see a spike after the after the game camp came out of just have like younger fans you know, that's what's been so interesting about, about it all the way throughout is it spanned ages. 
because people love scary movies and, you know, um, it's just spanned. It's like gone from grandparents to kids to grandkids all across the board. It's just, you know, it's just fun. And, and um, I, I was surprised to see that when I, I think the first convention I went to was Chiller, which was so much fun and crazy. Um, and I was surprised at the different ages and how much the younger people know about this show. They, they know more than I do. <laughs> yeah. Fans are crazy. That's, that's Peter right there. That's Peter just knows every little detail of that movie. <laughs> yeah, sure I go back and, and, and watch all of it again, very carefully to be sure I don't miss anything when I bring her back to life. <laughs> and that's the other thing I was telling Laura about too, um, Riley is I have a lot of, a lot of, you know, this too props and things that were actually in part seven even little things, pictures in the background. I'm trying to make certain scenes like almost, so you think you're back in seven at certain points. Yeah, that, that's, that's pretty insane. I, I remember in that, in that cabin looking at um, the prop guys that created that cabin and the house were so good because every little thing felt old. You know, like the family hadn't been there in a really long time and the picture of the dad on the wall and <clears throat> in that frame and it looked that little hat that he's wearing or little yeah. plaid jacket i think it was yeah i wish we had the very original necklace that the locket um yeah. from from the very beginning but i think we're going to have um something similar right a remake I have it right here in the box yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's i mean i don't think it's exactly the same because um yours is a little light, light. it's hard to see if you go back and look at it like how it is I went. I looked at hundreds of pictures and freeze frame, but it's not like perfectly close. Right. It had a little design on the outside. Yes. On like one side, upper left corner, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I try. It's hard to find that exactly, but I figure fans will forgive me if it's not perfect. Yeah, I think that that'll 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 be a good representation of it. Yeah. You know, and um, so is is the suit going to smell as bad this time on on um, Jason as it did in some? <laughs> no, uh, uh, our Jason actually takes showers. Kane doesn't. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah, because the um, uh, stinky J stinky Voorhees, they called stinky him, right? Voorhees, yes. Yeah. Yes. And that guy went on to be a great director. Are you? Are you? Who were you talking about there, Bill? Um, the the guy that gets killed in the Billy or whatever in the film. Billy, yeah. 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 William William Butler, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's amazing. He writes and directs, and of course, he came from the special effects background too. Right. Uh, and and has worked in that field forever so yeah i um i want did you um have you talked to dr cruz terry kaiser because i yeah. saw him at a show about a year and a half two years ago the nicest guy i've ever met in my life oh, total total class act he told me about weekend at bernie's there's a scene where they throw him he's dead you know they throw him over the ledge they broke his ribs Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and he said he, he said he really wasn't a superstar then, and he didn't want to tell them that he broke his ribs because they would just put another hat and glasses on somebody else, and he would be <laughs> fired. So, so he said he, he went the whole movie with broken ribs, and then later that night we were eating dinner, and he's a big Golden State Warriors fan, and we talked basketball. He pulled his chair all the way over to me to to watch the game with me and talk to me. So he, that guy's a, a class act. So I wonder how it was working with him. He's fabulous. He's absolutely fabulous. It was fun because uh, he's also an acting coach. Um, mm. and, and he was here in Texas for a while too, which, which was great. So I've really enjoyed um, chatting with him. And one of his favorite shows was doing uh, the Circus of the Stars. It was way back in the day. And so we looked really hard to find because he sticks his head in a lion's mouth. That's what he does in that Circus of the Stars episode. It was so cool. So we really, we didn't find the actual episode, but we found some great pictures of him with working with the lions. That was really neat. Yeah. Um, I didn't get to do circus with the stars because they wanted me to be on a, a high wire trap, you know, one of those trapezes. I'm like, mm, no, we're not doing that. And <laughs> there was, I, I couldn't really do any fabulous tricks. I just wanted to ride an elephant or dance with a poodle. And they're like, not for what we're paying. So <laughs> I didn't get to be on circus with the stars. Oh, wow. Well. Well, uh, Peter, is there anything else that you want to squeeze in here, uh, whether that's pushing the Indiegogo, which still has a little bit of time left? Uh, it's doing great, by the way, but still. Yeah. The we want everybody to get in there and make yeah. the last few days just sing for us so we can bring even more of it to life, even more of the story to life. 
hundred percent. So I've got some more perks that are coming up. Um, I think after this interview, we're really going to get another big spike. Um, me and Lara, we're talking about working on one more, maybe special edition. So um, some things that we'll see, but the money will, will help with that. Um, and, and that's it. I mean, I, I'll leave the, the mic to, to Lar, if you want to talk about maybe expulsion or anything you're working on, that that's fine with us too. Well, that's true. I do have expulsion that's out right now, running on all the streaming platforms, and that was a really fun movie. That was a um, an independent uh, group of guys that wrote this really super science fiction show. I loved it. Um, I was uh, coaching the the guy that played the lead, Colton Tapp, who's fabulous, and. Uh, he played a dual lead in that. So I had a lot of fun aging myself to play someone who's kind of going through multiple universes in time. That that was my goal with that. So I think they did a great job as a small independent film, putting uh, a lot of special effects together. Right. I know that's a huge job. It's a huge job. So I had that going on and um, um, shooting another film the end of this month called Autumn's Road. So I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. Nice, got a lot going. And you were involved with 13 Fanboy as well. Yeah. Well, that's true. That's yeah. yes. <laughs> Deborah Foreman, who, who directed that, oh my gosh. I remember having the first conversation with her and talking about the character. And then we shot in New Mexico. Um, thank goodness got it all done before COVID hit, like, oh, by the skin of their teeth. And it was really neat because that's a show about a stalker that comes after the the real life actors, although we're still playing just versions, you know, obviously of ourselves. And um, she really let my character basically lose her mind with, with torment. So um, I loved that. I had, I had uh, been uh, in a stalker's um, lair for many years dealing with that. So it was fun to do that movie and kind of purge that little bit of aggravation away. <laughs> Yeah, I, 13 Fanboy uh, look is really special. It, it kind of gets tossed in with all these fan films because it's called Fanboy. Um, right. But it, it is, it's, it's its own film and it's really, really cool. I was supposed to, Deborah asked me to, to be in New Mexico for shooting and I, I couldn't make it at the time and I wish I could have, but um, yeah, I, it, everything looks amazing. I'm really excited for her and everyone else involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does yeah, look great. It, so many stars. Yeah. So many, and we did so many neat locations on that. Uh, I was shooting in an actual boiler room of an old basement, which was the real thing and filthy, dirty. Um, I mean, cause it was on the floor and it's black and dirty everywhere. And uh, I had to, we had to drive like two hours to get to the airport or three from the location. I had to be there very early the next day. And I was at an Airbnb up in a cabin. They put me in a cabin, like in the woods. <laughs> It's a little creepy. Um, and I remember taking a shower being so covered in that soot of that boiler room. And then I had to clean the whole bathtub and everything. I didn't want someone who I rented the Airbnb from to think I had left their bathtub covered in soot. So <laughs> that was a that was a crazy night. But you know, you do whatever you can to make the scene look real. Right. Whatever it takes, yeah. yeah. <laughs>